Okay, let's now revise the chapter of compromises, arrangements and amalgamation. In this chapter, we have sections 230 to 240. Not a very huge section, but sometimes uh, the students don't understand the underlying concept in this chapter. And hence, they end up thinking that this is a very boring chapter. However, if you ask me, this is the most relatable chapter to your practical life. If you have to or if you're planning to pursue your career somewhere in the field of mergers, acquisitions and like, then undoubtedly this is one such thing that you must, must, must know. If I share with you, although we have discussed all this in our regular class, but if I share with you uh, one of the scheme of compromise, scheme of amalgamation arrangement, you can clearly see that under sections 230 to 232 of Companies Act 2013. So this is not something which has been drafted by me, but it is the scheme of amalgamation which actually happens in the real life, in the practical world between Bharti Infratel uh, and Indus uh, Towers, right? So actually you find the relevance of the section. It is absolutely, of course, Along with other provisions, this is something which is very important. Now, since it is a revision class, we cannot go into very much depth about the terms and I have already explained you the terms. However, the chapter involves three broad terms that is compromise, arrangement and amalgamation. If I talk about compromise, compromise means some type of sacrifice. The sacrifice could be uh, between members and the company or between creditors and the company. So might be creditors are sacrificing something for the company. Uh, maybe the company is not in a very good financial state and so the creditors are sacrificing some portion of their debt or maybe some interest portion or something like that. So that is a scheme of compromise that's taking place. Arrangement is a kind of residuary terms which includes every other thing which is not compromise or amalgamation. It could be some reconstruction of capital, alteration of capital, etc, uh, etc. Et now what do you mean by amalgamation? Although the chapter heading uses only the term amalgamation when we switch to the sections we find the term merger amalgamation demerger all of that so what do we mean by that if i talk about merger it could be in by formation of a new company or by acquisition by acquisition means uh, or by absorption means x plus y is equal to y so you don't form any new company an old company absorbs another company in a, into itself or the merger could be by formation of a new company so i could say that maybe a plus b is equal to c so there is a new company which has come into consideration and two other companies have two old companies have lost its existence now when i switch to amalgamation amalgamation could be in the nature of merger or could be in the nature of purchase in the nature of merger it fit satisfies the all the criteria right and if uh, it doesn't satisfy all the criteria then it's going to be in the nature of purchase right that is something which is not needed because the act does not identify or does not recognize any difference between two and has not stated different provisions for uh, amalgamation merger merger in the uh, amalgamation in the nature of purchase demerger no there are like provisions for all these cases okay and we have section 230 which is for compromise and arrangement and section 232 which is for merger amalgamation demerger however section 232 is not complete it does not give us an elaborate or detailed and exhaustive procedure as to how merger and amalgamation should be proceeded with and redirects us to section 230 so i hope you understand that the most important section of this particular chapter is section 230 undoubtedly fine so we'll start with the revision the very first section section 237 where uh, there is a power to make compromise or arrangements with creditors as well as members so company may enter into any scheme of compromise or arrangement uh, as I told you, example could be internal reconstruction, example could be some debt restructuring and like things between company and creditors, between company and members. So in this a situation, they have to take permission of NCLT. 
for taking permission they will make an application there is a whole procedure which has been given under section 230 it starts with making of an application it starts with making of an application members creditor liquidator or company they can make an application and form nclt 1 to nclt this application will be will be um, accompanied with the affidavit containing disclosure, copy of scheme and fees. Now this may be accepted, this may be rejected. Once it is accepted, the next step is that NCLT orders to hold meeting. Hold meeting of whom ma'am? NCLT is concerned that are all the creditors, are all the members who are concerned, who are involved happy about it? Right. Are they happy and are, have they actually approved it? That is the main concern of NCLT at the first place. So NCLT asks the company to send notice to your creditors and members and take their approval and thereafter report to me whether they have approved or not. Then we will consider and sanction your scheme. Okay. So NCLT orders to hold meeting. Chairperson calls the meeting by sending notice. The notice which is sent to the members, to the creditors is accompanied by the details of compromise or arrangement, valuation report, effect and other matters. At the same time, one notice is also sent to the statutory authorities. Statutory authorities could be income tax, could be central government, CB, registrar, stock exchange, uh, competition commission of India and all that. Why it is sent to the statutory authorities to seek objections from them. If they have any objection, they can also give objection within 30 days. Okay. Now, this notice is also advertised English newspaper, vernacular newspaper and is placed on the website. If it is a listed company, it's also sent to stock exchange and SEBI. Fine. Now, after sending this notice, advertising it, placing it on website with all these details to creditors and members, then the meeting is held. In the meeting, the creditors members will vote. Accordingly, they will give their approval, right? Fine, they will give their approval. How can they vote? They can vote in person, they can vote by proxy, they can vote by postal ballot. So an option of postal ballot is also made available to them. Now here the approval is not a normal one. That is if there are a thousand members we cannot say that if 600 members have approved then we accord the approval. No. The approval is a two-way approval. Majority of members holding or representing three-fourth value and this is not of total it is of the members who are present and voting. Okay, so if the number of members is uh, 500, then majority comes out to be 251. So at least 251 members holding three-fourth value share capital. Say supposedly the share capital is 10 lakh, then at least 7 lakh 50 thousand share capital should be held by these 251 members who have given the approval. If that is so, then only we will consider the scheme to be approved. The same goes for the creditors also. Creditors majority in number representing at least three-fourth value. Okay. After this approval is taken, the next thing is that NCLT also needs auditor's certificate that whatever accounting treatment is going to be taken place in the books that will be in accordance with the accounting standards as well as India's applicable, right? So after it has been approved, after CA certificate has been re received, then tribunal sanctions the scheme. Of course, after considering the objections of statutory authorities, whatever order is passed shall bind everyone. However, and the tribunal shall send the order to the company within 30 days file it to registrar. What is going to be the contents of order? What is going to be the contents of order? Variation of rights, that is the first thing. Variation of rights means what? We have a section, section 48, which tells that if 
you have to vary the rights of a shareholder then in that situation you need to take their approval right if it affects some other class then you take approval of that class also etc etc so there is a procedure which has been given in case your compromise or arrangement is somehow altering the rights then you must follow section number 48 section number 48 okay then uh, to dissenting shareholders dissenting shareholders um, exit offer is given conversion of share capital when preference share capital is being converted into equity under a scheme of compromise or arrangement supposedly there was some preference capital on which preference dividend was not paid for four years now under a scheme of compromise they are converting under a scheme of arrangement they are being converted into equity option will be given to them that was pending four years dividend either you take in cash or an equivalent amount of shares get that converted into an equivalent amount of shares fine then uh, all the proceedings of BIFR shall abate what do you mean by proceedings of BIFR shall abate see if it is a sick company it moves to BIFR to revive itself now Supposedly, we have interacted with our creditors and the creditors have somehow uh, reduced our repayment burden in some manner. Now, the company itself is in a position to grow. Earlier, the company, all the money that the company was earning was going into the EMI. Now, it has been relaxed and the company has funds to invest into the core business and thereafter earn huge profits. Right. So, there is a ray of hope that the company will automatically come back to its good financial state post this compromise or arrangement and hence that BIFR proceedings are not required. So, they shall come on hold. Okay. So, um, and this buyback or reduction of capital what I have written, it uh, simply means that if you have to go for buyback, then you will also follow the scheme of buyback that is you have to follow section number 68. Okay. And uh, now we come to section 231. Tribunal has sanctioned the scheme. Tribunal has the power to supervise its implementation. Um, make modifications as and when needed to implement give directions and if at all tribunal finds that it is impossible to implement the scheme in a manner as it was sanctioned and it will not bring a rise effect and if not implemented the company will not be able to pay its debts that means company is in a kind of insolvency state then in such a situation tribunal might pass winding up orders that is closing down the company okay fine now we come to section number 232 merger and amalgamation of companies so we are talking about the case of merger amalgamation demerger all of that whenever an application here also you need nclt approval here also there is a whole elaborate procedure and exactly the same procedure as we have read in section 230 however the section is different and uh, so we cannot say that if i am talking about a case of merger i give my answer in accordance with section 232 no in accordance with section 230 to 232 fine okay so applicant makes an application to nclt for seeking approval nclt finds that the application relates to merger amalgamation or demerger so it will order the meeting of creditors members any class as it does in section 230 also and the same provisions of section 230 will apply that is the notice will be sent to persons advertisement website everything statutory authorities notice then approval will be taken from members or creditors and thereafter scheme will be sanctioned okay there is one more point which is written over here objection allowed which i haven't explained you in section 230 what do you mean by objection allowed it is very important point okay see some of the members or creditors since the company got the approval as needed of three-fourth value majority so the company proceeded with the scheme but there might be some people who are not very happy about it 
See, there are two types of people, one who are not happy, but still they accept it. And ones who are not happy and become rebellious. So these are the rebellious ones they want to oppose. We have to check, are they capable enough to oppose? Because capability criteria has been specified. Who is eligible to oppose that has been specified? Who can object? more than equal to 10% of share capital or more than equal to 5% of debt in the case of members and creditors respectively. Okay, so this is how that is going to take place. The same objection criteria is specified here also because the same provisions apply in this case also. But ma'am, undoubtedly there should be something different in section 232 or something additional in section 232 because we have a separate section for mergers and amalgamation and a separate one for compromise and arrangement. So undoubtedly there is some difference. Yes, there is. There are two major differences or there are two major additions in case of merger and amalgamation. One you have to circulate additional documents to your scheme will contain for these okay so along with the notice there are some additional documents which have to be sent uh, that is draft notice uh, sorry draft scheme complete scheme there was only then um, it's confirmation confirmation that it has been filed with roc valuation report financial statement or you can say supplementary accounting statement if if it's not in all cases if the financial year end was six months ago so in that case a supplementary accounting statement the report by directors with regard to effect of merger and amalgamation along with the exchange ratio exchange um, uh, what is the price they're going to get and all that right so this will additionally be circulated along with the notice if it is a case of merger amalgamation demerger if all the conditions are satisfied with and certificate of auditor received then tribunal may sanction the scheme now the scheme must contain for these following since it is a case of merger amalgamation or demerger after it is sanctioned, the order is sent to the company and company files it with registrar within 30 days. This point I'll discuss a little later. First, we are going to discuss the orders. The points which must be there in the scheme, otherwise tribunal can pass orders in this regard. First is transfer of undertaking. Whenever a scheme of merger or amalgamation takes place, undoubtedly there is transfer of assets liabilities sometimes it could be transfer of just one undertaking and like things whatever it is you have to give adequate information about what is going to be transferred how it is going to be transferred second is with respect to purchase consideration so what are you going to allot allotment of shares right so uh, order about that continuation of legal proceedings the legal proceedings or the legal cases shall be now against the transferee company. So from transferor company, they'll come to transferee company. The transferor company, that is the old company which is being now merged into the transferee company, this company, all the assets, liabilities have all been taken over by this transferee company. Now this company is... A kind of empty box which has nothing in it however it does not die because it has to die a legal death since it is a legal person so we have to dissolve it so no winding up needed because it does not has an, have any assets liabilities however we must dissolve it we must remove its existence okay then uh, shares to non-resident shareholders we have to make sure that fdi compliance is done the employees of transferor company to go to the transferee company set off of fees and before that we have listed companies supposedly a listed company is being merged into unlisted company so this unlisted company will remain unlisted only there it will not become listed just because it has acquired a listed company no if you marry a celebrity you don't become a celebrity or you do actually become a celebrity but here the same is not going to apply and um, 
set off of fees what is it what do you mean by that supposedly a plus b is equal to c so we have to incorporate a new company c incorporation fees is there but these a and b they are going to dissolve so whatever fees have been paid by them they can be set off other incidental matters other incidental matters right apart from this we have this um, another point which is the scheme of amalgamation merger takes quite some time and if it is uh, at a stretch of two years, three years, at the end of every financial year. Within 200 days, there has to be a certificate of compliance certified by CACS CMA, which is going to be filed with ROC. Okay. That yes, whatever scheme was sanctioned by tribunal, we are following the same. Now, merger and amalgamation of certain companies, this is also known as fast track merger, but it is not available for all types of companies. Okay. It is available for small companies. It is available for holding and it's 100% subsidiary. It's available for prescribed companies, which are startups and startup with a small company. So in these four cases, Companies, instead of going through that long route, they can also opt for fast track merger under section 233. What is the procedure that they have to follow under section 233 is a matter of concern over here. We don't need approval of NCLT. That's the most important point over here. Instead of NCLT's approval, we need CG's approval. Now, how is it going to be fast then? Undoubtedly, taking approval from CG is way more easier than NCLT because CG is as good as MCA, right? So, we have to take that approval. But before that, we have to take approval from members and creditors. Members and creditors so first of all we take approval from members as well as our creditors this is not the case in section 230 or 232 but here we have to take approval from both members and creditors we send a notice to seek objection to just two people that is roc and official liquidator who is the officer of high court so we send um, the notice if they have objection they will give objection and thereafter when we get sanctioned when we get uh, approval from our members and creditors, we file this with central government and central government grants us approval and the scheme is implemented. So that's how the process works. Both the companies, that is the transferer company and the transferee company, they both file declaration of solvency with registrar and this is a separate requirement. Here the process starts. First thing that they are going to do is send a notice inviting objections from registrar and official liquidator. And after that, you have to call meetings, meetings of shareholders, meetings of creditors, right? So you call the meeting wherein uh, they are present and you need to take their approval. How ma'am? Approval has to be as it was in section 230, the answer is no. Here the criteria of approval is different. And you have to very well remember the criteria of approval under section 233 and section 230. There are two different things. Their majority number representing three fourth value dual type of approval was needed. Here for members you only need that members should represent at least 90% um, of shares. 90% of shares. And if it is creditors, majority representing 90% value. So here you need dual approval. Here you just need 90% of shares. Fine. Okay. If, if, if registrar or official liquidator wants to object, they can make objections within 30 days. They have a time period of making objections. Now, you called 
the members, you called the creditors, took their approval, you also sent a notice to ROC and official liquidator. The next step is that after taking the approval within seven days, you file the scheme with central government, ROC and official liquidator. There are two instances which may happen. ROC or official liquidator have an objection, they don't have an objection. If they don't have any objection, central government finds no problem, central government will register the scheme, pass the order of approval, the same order of approval will be sent to the company, company will file it with ROC. The old company will dissolve and other transfer of assets, liabilities all will take place. Okay. If objection is there, or central government finds that it is not in the public interest that this merger should take place, then central government leaves the case and transfers it to tribunal. So central government makes an application to tribunal and requests that you consider the scheme under section 238 because you are more competent to do so. Now it is at the discretion of tribunal that they can sanction the scheme or process the scheme according to section 232. Fine. Okay. Next is section 234, merger or amalgamation of uh, foreign company. So Indian company can merge into foreign company, foreign company can merge into Indian company. The provisions are the same. So we have to follow section 232, 230 to 232 only for this also. And here one important point that you have to remember is that foreign company does not mean company incorporated outside India and having a place of business in India as we read in the definition no. Whether having a place of business in India or not, that is the foreign company for this particular section. So what is the additional requirement ma'am? If we have to follow the section 230 to 232, what is the additional requirement? Additional requirement is that you need RBI's approval. You need approval from RBI. Moreover, the consideration may be paid in cash, depository receipts or a mix of both. One more point which is there in rule, it states that Supposedly, Indian company is being merged into the foreign company. So, the foreign company will pay shareholders of these Indian companies. What will they pay? What will they pay? They pay us uh, an equivalent amount of shares. So, what is going to be the exchange ratio? That will be decided by that foreign company. So foreign company will take help of a competent person. Here we have registered valuers. What about there? So it is stated that uh, their valuation should be done by some members who are undoubtedly the member of recognized body which follows internationally accepted principles of valuation. So that we can be sure of fair valuation. Okay, so this is an important point that um, is there, fine. And moreover, um, uh, we also have to take care of the jurisdiction that foreign company which is incorporated, which must be incorporated in certain jurisdictions uh, where securities market regulators, they are anti-money laundering, etc, etc. And that we have to take care of and uh, you can merge only with the company of that particular jurisdiction, fine. Moving on to the next section, section 235. One company wants to acquire another company as its 100% subsidiary. That means want to buy the shares of, want to buy all the shares of that particular company. So, the company gives an offer to the shareholders of that company that you sell your shares to me because I have an intention to take all the shares. I give you four months, you can either reject or accept, it's completely your choice. But supposedly it is accepted by 9 tenth value of shareholders. Then it's going to give a huge power to the company. I, the company, now gets the power to acquire shares of even those people who did not agree. This might sound harsh to you, but I hope you remember the logic that I explained to you in the 
um, comprehensive class right so we have discussed it thoroughly that why the section is being introduced and it is for the good no it's not definitely not harsh okay so within four months they can accept or reject in case this approval is acquired but there are some shareholders who disagree then in such a situation transferee company what they will do is they will send a notice to the ones who disagreed that we are going to acquire your shares they're not happy with it so within one month they can apply to tribunal if tribunal finds that something wrong is happening to them they will tribunal will um, give the result in favor and we have to stop but if the appeal is dismissed or you don't apply at all then we will take our next course of action which is executing the transfer deed for transferring the shares of yours into our name but we'll not give it to you we'll give it to your company so we will give the transfer deed we will give the notice that we sent to you copy of notice as well as the money to your company and this company will inform you that the shares are no more yours because the company has registered the shares in our name so the transfer has taken place so it will be informed to the dissenting shareholders that the shares are no more yours they have been transferred to this company and the fact that we have received your money and it will be disbursed in 60 days okay so this is the case section 236 is quite close yet has a difference what is the difference over here ma'am that uh, before that before that let me let me uh, take you over here section 238 it just tells us about the attachments that whenever a transferee company gives an offer it also contains the board of directors recommendation the, the uh, statement that if you accept the offer necessary cash will be available you will get adequate cash and thereafter you can sell the shares and that we have registered the circular with ROC see whatever offer you are giving you also have to register it with ROC if ROC refuses to register you cannot go ahead and make an offer there is a penalty also of 1 lakh for that okay now section 236 purchase of minority shareholding supposedly over the period of time some person has got or has become the shareholder of more than equal to 90 percent of equity share capital then he can acquire the remaining ones also how you will notify your intention to minority shareholders there are two options they might also offer to sell their shares or you can make an offer now this is something which is uh, which has to be considered predetermined price whatever offer you will be made at a predetermined price and this pricing has been quite uh, illustrated through the rules also a registered valuer will be higher he will value the price yet that will not be the price we have to ensure that what SEBI releases as the fair price or if it is an unlisted company then what is the fair price that can be calculated on the basis uh, of what price has been paid in the last 12 months all this is not uh, something that you must remember but I'm just telling you for information so based on that we decide that higher of what registered value has taken out or what SEBI has given as a fair value so uh, according to SEBI regulations what has come at the fair value higher of these two that is the predetermined price okay <clears throat> that is the predetermined price because here at once the offer is not being made offer is made in chunks sometimes you're buying two shares three shares and likewise you have attained this particular point already and now you're availing this particular section so what you will do is you will deposit consideration in a separate bank account you give the money to transferor company only so transferor company only receives money pays money collects share certificate discards it issue new certificates it acts as a transfer agent in that regard and uh, deposit money in separate bank account which remains valid for one year so one year anyone can take payment from that bank account the amount has to be dispersed within 60 days 
Now one important or additional point which is there in this section which students fail to understand is that there is this minority which has which ha which was already 10% or lesser in this minority there is a majority and minority majority which holds more than equal to 75% of holding and minority which holds less than equal to 25% of holding now in this minority the majority negotiates with that shareholder with that actual majority shareholder and gets a higher price or get some more money for sale of shares because they are a good chunk they can negotiate or they reach an understanding that I want more money whatever more money they receive they have to give or they have to share that additional compensation even with the minority minority segment of shareholders okay fine section 237 if central government is satisfied that two companies must merge into one another, central government can pass such order. What about our wishes, our will? Central government will first draft the order, send it to both the companies that you both have to merge. This is my order. If you have objection, you can give the objection within two months. Your rights and liabilities will not be affected. If at all the rights of members, creditors are affected, then you will get compensation for it and if you're not satisfied with the compensation you can even appeal to tribunal within 30 days so draft is made it is sent to the companies companies can object within two months if companies don't object fine if they object then central government will consider the objections make necessary modifications if needed and thereafter pass the final order in official gazette which will implement the merger scheme and this is also going to be laid in the houses of parliament right after that we have section 239 which just says that whatever company has been merged has been amalgamated the books and papers of that company cannot be disposed of destroyed without the permission of central government so you need to make an application to central government for seeking permission central government will ensure that there is no evidence left of any offense prospective offense and thereafter permit you section number 240 states that if two companies are merged the old company had committed an offense and some officer in default was responsible he was he will continue to be liable even after this merger demerger amalgamation whatever is taking place right so that is all about this particular chapter's revision